Fascinating people, fascinating places. G'day and welcome to the Dan Mainwaring Podcast. This is where we talk to and about the famous and the infamous, the celebrated and the obscure, the well-known and the undiscovered. Interviews, articles and discussions from around the globe. In the spring of 2019, Scottish police launched investigations into incidents at two football matches. In the first, Aberdeen fans were accused of using colourful language to suggest that English football manager Stephen Gerrard was an orange man. A few weeks later, Aberdeen's own manager, Derek McInnes, was targeted with similar chants from Celtic fans. The fact that fans from Aberdeen, a largely secular city, could find themselves on either side of this type of incident is indicative of the fact that many of us have little understanding of the subject. For one thing, when you remove the accompanying pejoratives, any actual member of the Orange Order would be quite proud of his membership and his heritage. But it's this kind of conflict, based around misunderstanding and prejudice, that I was all too familiar with having grown up in the 1980s. On one hand, We saw in the news how the IRA, a nominally Catholic terrorist group, would plant bombs and do battle with the nominally Protestant groups like the UPF. But somehow, in the back and forth, amid accusations of doing right and wrong, a group of people known as the Orange Order would get drawn into the conflict, seemingly just for holding commemorative marches. Meanwhile, outspoken firebrand Protestant politician Ian Paisley was often held up by rivals as the archetypal orange man, even though he had long since left the group. Incidentally, the apparently extremist Paisley went on to form a close relationship with former IRA leader Martin McGuinness. The stereotypes you hear are of Presbyterian Scots-Irish doing battle with Irish Catholics, but anyone with even a cursory knowledge of Irish history could tell you this was an inaccurate oversimplification. As someone with mixed Irish and English, Catholic and Protestant heritage, I've always been curious to learn more about the Orange Order, who they are, what are their origins, what do they actually believe, and above all, to understand the group in the context of its origins versus what it represents today. I was fortunate enough to find an expert in the field, Dr. Jonathan Matteson, curator of the Museum of Orange Heritage in Northern Ireland. Before we hear from Jonathan, it's important to understand a little context about Anglo-Irish relations and religion. It's complicated, to say the least. Ireland had technically been under English control since Henry II of England sent troops there at the behest of Irish chieftain Dermot McMurray. But the English had largely left the Irish to their own devices until the Reformation, when Henry VIII posed the question of royal supremacy versus the Popes. His nephew, King James, whose name adorns the Protestant Bible, encouraged Protestants from England and Scotland to move to Ireland in order to promote Protestantism in a nation that had largely remained loyal to Rome. But it wasn't simply a matter of Protestant versus Catholic. James was promoting his authority as head of the official, or what we now call the Anglican Church. Nonconformist Protestants, including Presbyterians and Puritans, also faced a degree of discrimination. Thereafter, his son, James II, controversially converted to Catholicism before acceding to the throne, something which prompted the English Parliament to invite his son-in-law, the Dutch William of Orange, to seize the crown of England. Conflict followed, and James's forces were eventually defeated in Ireland. A century later, Penal laws that prevented, among other things, Catholics from inheriting land were relaxed, but revolutions in America and France inspired an independence movement in Ireland. It was in this environment that the Orange Order was formed, as Jonathan Matheson explains. The formation of the the Orange Institution, the Orange Order, as it's commonly known, was really formed in 1795. Now, there were a number of organisations that fed into that since the Glorious Revolution in the 1690s. You had the Aldermen of Skinner's Alley, you had the Boyne Societies in the 1770s, and all these groups and the Orange Boys in the early 1790s in the Armagh to border 
and they were precursors to what became the Orange Institution. Uh, it developed at a time when politics, particularly at a local level, was quite fractious in Ireland. The war with revolutionary and then Napoleonic France had created problems economically. And because obviously land is finite, a lot of the smaller farmers supplemented their income with weaving, with textile production. There was competition for this, obviously, with the war had expanded textiles in England. And as a consequence, there was a lot of competition and an economic downturn in parts of Ireland. And the result was the creation of a number of secret agrarian societies. Some were cross-community, but others were denominational in terms of either being Protestant or Roman Catholic. And these societies tended to fight each other, particularly at any aspects of community gatherings like fairs and markets. But they also had a more sinister element and attacked each other uh, during the night. And you were either doing it to steal or run off your neighbor's cattle, or the, there was an economic motivation as well as sectarian for a lot of this warfare. That you wanted to break into your neighbor's home to smash up his weaving loom. The two major groups in Armagh were the Peepa Day Boys, which was a Protestant secret society, and they got their nickname because they staged a lot of their attacks at dawn or the break of day. And the largest Roman Catholic group was, seen, was called the Defenders, and they saw themselves as defending their community. And there were several clashes took place in the Armagh, Tyrone, sort of Calvin, Monaghan area of what is now the border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. And the biggest clash took place in September of 1795, when a large party of defenders assembled to t- attack a small Protestant hamlet at the Diamond Crossroads outside Loch Gaul, near Portadown in County Armagh. And the accusation made was that Dan Winter was a member of the Orange Boys, and the Orange Boys were secretly using Dan Winter's spirit grocers, his you know, pub, essentially, as a place of meeting. Now, there was no evidence for this, but in a divided society, sometimes evidence is very lacking in terms of motivation. So the defenders, despite interventions from both Protestant and Roman Catholic clergy, the defenders attacked the hamlet, and the local Protestants sent for help, and more farmers and agrarian workers arrived and were well-armed, and they fought off the defenders and that became known as the Battle of the Diamond. After the battle itself, the victorious Protestants decided that they would create one organisation. They would get rid of all this myriad of uh, secret agrarian societies like the Peepa Day Boys, form one organisation. So they adjourned from Dan Winters and the cottage to Sloan's House in Loch Gaul, where they created and formed what would become the Loyal Orange Institution. And it's two main names. Whatever else has been added down through the centuries, the two main aims from that 21st of September 1795 were the mutual defence and protection of Irish Protestant hearth and home and the promotion of the Reformed faith. And the organisation spread so quickly that a national leadership and a structure was introduced in 1798. You had quite a few of the local gentry became involved, people like the Blackers and the Atkinsons and Armagh. And they created a national leadership in the form of the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland. And this pyramid structure quickly developed that the institution continues to have, that there are private lodges at the base. They select representatives to district lodges, which are a bit like parishes. I suppose it's the closest analogy that you would have in Ireland to that. And then to county Grand Lodges, and then to the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland. And while... It is a pyramid structure. It is very democratic in terms of look in that all power lies with the ordinary member with the lodge just at the base of that pyramid. One thing I wanted to pick up on was you were talking about the sectarian conflicts leading up to 1795. And then in 1798, there was the Irish Rebellion, which I think from a modern perspective, a lot of people tend to look at things purely as Catholic versus Protestant. But in 1798, you had the rebellion, but there are a lot of Presbyterians who were involved in that as well. Did that create a divide among the Protestant community? Because obviously the Orange Men were Protestant, but that's a pretty broad church, as it were, with Presbyterians and Anglicans. How did that play out in terms of the Protestant community? Yes, the, the rebellion, the 1798 rebellion created, I suppose it was a result of deep divisions that were already in place in Ireland. 
And those divisions were not just Protestant Roman Catholic, as you have said, they were between Protestant denominations. Some of the remaining hangovers from the old penal legislation that was passed by a very paranoid Anglican Dublin Parliament in the wake of the Glorious Revolution affected anyone who wasn't from the Anglican Communion. And some of those restrictions were still in place by the end of the 18th century. The rebellion broke out and a lot of those radical idealists were Presbyterians. Um, some of them were heavily influenced, obviously, by both the French and the American revolutions. The descendants of a lot of those who had taken part in the Glorious Revolution and the Williamite Jacobite Wars in Ireland, fighting for William of Orange, ended up fighting the British during the American War of Independence. So that filtered down, that radicalism within certainly the Presbyterian community filtered down. And although there were Presbyterians and other dissenters involved in the Orange Institution, from its outset, it became predominantly a conservative and Church of Ireland dominated, an Anglican dominated organisation in those first early years. And that created divisions because the Orange Institution saw itself as, if you like, protectors or custodians of the Glorious Revolution and therefore uh, put themselves on the side of law and order. And in 1798, naturally, that put them on opposite side from a lot of Presbyterians, particularly in Ulster who fought for the United Irishmen. And that creates a very interesting aspect to our history and and very anecdotally, even in my own family. My mother's side of the family were all from the Orange tradition that fought for the government. My father's side of the family in 1798 were actually were Presbyterian and fought for the United Irishmen. You have those contradictions that continue to exist, but largely those divisions were highlighted by the rebellion and you had a radical Presbyterian element that certainly was set opposed to that Anglican dominated early Orangism. Now that would disappear as the 19th century wore on with the Act of Union and with the creation of a different political landscape within Ireland in the 1820s and 30s. You saw more Presbyterians joining with their Church of Ireland colleagues within the Orange Constitution and certainly by 1869 um, the final removal of the last privileges really for the Church of Ireland when it was disestablished. There was no longer that same level of tension between Presbyterians and members of the Anglican tradition and you saw more and more Presbyterians then joining the Orange Institution from that mid-19th century onwards. In the 1820s, the British passed a law about unlawful oaths and it affected secret societies including the Orange Men, as I understand it. Yes, there were two pieces of legislation, the Unlawful Oaths Act and the Secret Societies Act. Essentially, it was a hangover from that period of conflict with Napoleonic France. And the government were continually paranoid about the existence of secret societies and organisations. And they changed the law on several occasions between 1800 and the 1830s and Their target was secret societies, but it really impacted nearly every organisation that existed. Groups and societies and organisations had to change their ruling documents, their constitution, to stay within the law. And there were a couple of occasions in the 1820s and then again in the 1830s when the Orange Institution didn't change its rules and regulations and constitution quickly enough. And as a consequence, the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland, the leadership body, dissolved twice. Now, a lot of, because of Orangism by that stage of a generation and a little bit on, was so embedded within Protestant communities in Ireland, a lot of Orange Lodges continued to meet in secret. Some of them reorganised as constitutional clubs. Others became shooting societies. And you see the rise of groups like, you know, Conservative Constitutional Associations, the Brunswick Clubs in the latter part of the 1820s. And these were really fronts for what had been Orange Lodges. It took some time for if you like, the reorganisation to take effect and for Grand Lodge to change the constitution enough for that to remain within the law. There was an alleged conspiracy maybe between the Duke of Cumberland, who was Queen Victoria's uncle, and the Orangemen to try to have him put on the throne. I wondered if that was indicative of any tensions from the Oaths Act and other things between the Protestants in Northern Ireland versus the the British government at the time, if indeed that conspiracy was real? It sold a lot of newspapers. There was a heightened political tension 
The rise of Daniel O'Connell in the 1820s and the development of the Catholic Association was a move to remove the last vestiges of the penal legislation, you know, reform so that you could allow Roman Catholics to sit in Parliament. And But then there was a move for repeal of the Act of Union, and Orange men opposed that. Ironically, they had been opposed to the Act of Union in 1800, the majority of the Orange Order. The Grand Master tried to keep them out of politics and said, don't get involved in this debate. But they ignored him, and as a result, he actually resigned, Thomas Werner. But as the century wears on, you see the Orange men become, and the organisation become very much wedded to the act of union between uh, Great Britain and Ireland. The campaign ratcheted up by O'Connell in the 1830s, created a sort of a, a very heightened and tense political atmosphere, not only in Ireland, but also at Westminster. And the allegations started to emerge that the institution was almost a secret army within the British Army. O'Connell and opponents of the Orange Institution succeeded in getting a parliamentary select committee inquiry into the size and activities of Orangeism in Ireland, in Great Britain and Ireland. What it boiled down to was that the then Grand Master, the Duke of Cumberland, was seen as leading this, for want of a better term, a shadowy organisation. And some of the accusations that were bandied about, particularly in the press, was that there were 100,000 orange men in the British Army and that the Duke of Cumberland was going to launch a coup to try and place himself on the throne and remove Victoria. There was nothing to that. If you sat and if you looked at the actual evidence, there weren't 100,000 men in the British Army to begin with. So using 100,000 orange men in the British Army was rather strange, but it did result in a number of changes. Orange lodges had existed within the British Army since the United Irish Rebellion. Rebellion had actually sparked an increase in Orange membership of the Army. When units were brought across to Ireland to suppress the United Irish men, you saw Orange men joining these regular regiments of the line as well as militias. And when the 1798 Rebellion was put down, these units either moved back to Britain or started to go overseas as the British Empire began to grow. And so Orange Lodges had existed within the British Army since 1798. In 1833, the Grand Lodge of England, which was seen as the superior body, they decided that these military or marching warrants should no longer exist because they were drawing undue attention. And the inquiry also added to that, and there was a fear that the government was going to move to ban the Orange Institution. It did, it, made, it had a lot of political mileage. It was used by enemies of the institution to almost point out that they were some sort of shady, secretive organisation that was going to help the Duke of Cumberland, who was not the most endearing of characters within the royal family uh, at the time. I think he earned the nickname the Damnable Duke at one stage. But rather than bring embarrassment to the monarchy and the royal family, the Duke of Cumberland as Grand Master, he resigned as Grand Master, and the Grand Lodge of England and Ireland actually voted to dissolve for a time. They expected, obviously, the institutions to dissolve as well, but you had some lodges dissolve, but the vast majority continued, continued to meet in secret, continued to exist because Orangism had become very important, particularly in rural Irish Protestant communities by this stage. So uh, the attitude that was adopted was very much one of, well, if the aristocracy or the gentry want to leave, that's up to them. We're, we're sticking with this organisation. And that's one thing that, from its very outset, has been reflected within the operation of Orangism and the formal Orange institution, is that as a great levelling organisation. You know, the stable hand may have had to doff his cap all week to the landlord, but on Friday night, say, when the Orange Lodge met, it might be the stable hand who is sitting as worshipful master or chair of the Orange Lodge, and the landlord would have to come in and salute the worshipful master in the chair. So it was a hugely levelling and egalitarian organisation. And the abandonment, uh, or if you like, the, the decision by the Grand Lodges, particularly the Grand Lodge of Ireland, on a very close vote to dissolve, was largely ignored by the, the vast membership. Once you get into the end of the 19th century, start of 20th century, obviously the whole issue of Irish home rule comes up and develops from there. I was wondering at the time, from the perspective of the Orange men, was there hope or intention just to keep all of Ireland as part of the United Kingdom, 
or was there a sense that well we at least want to keep our part of it and that is what led to the split in the end it comes around a complex question as we said in 1800 the majority of orange men opposed the act of union as the 19th century wears on they become the chief architect or advocate to maintain the act of union it's the orange which creates the unionist party it provides the ideological armory for the unionist movement uh, that opposes home rule. Uh, another irony to add to the mix is that the Home Rule Association was formed by Isaac Butt in 1870, and Isaac Butt was a former Orange man. He'd been a member of the organisation during his time at Trinity College in Dublin, and, and he'd left as a consequence of the British government's treatment of Ireland during the famine. He felt that not enough had been done, and this resulted in him resigning from the Orange Institution. The determination, because the institution was an all-Ireland movement, the determination by Orange men was to maintain the whole of Ireland within the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. As you move into the third home rule crisis, 1911, right up until the First World War, the outbreak of the Great War, there is a movement whereby, because of demographics and population and economics, you see the development of some sort of separation ideology, not not only within the broad political and Irish political question, but also within unionism itself, and naturally then within Orangeism. Now that created great problems, given that the institution was an all Ireland body. When unionists in what would become Northern Ireland vote to accept partition, and they vote the Ulster Unionist Council vote to accept a six county. At Northern Ireland state as opposed to a nine county, that creates even more difficulties because you still have, at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, you still have considerable numbers of orange men in lodges and orange women in what would be the border counties of the Irish Republic, Donegal, Cavan, Monaghan, Leitrim, all contain very strong orange infrastructure and they see themselves as being cast aside by partition. The remark is often made that partition resulted in the nationalist community in Northern Ireland suddenly being, you're waking up British the next day, but the irony is the reality was the other way around. They had been within the Union. Irishness and Irish identity had been part of Britishness. Um, so the, the circumstances for the nationalist community and what would become Northern Ireland didn't actually change. They remained within the Union, albeit a devolved settlement. The situation is much different for the Orange family and the Unionist community than what would become the Irish Free State. They went to bed British and woke up the next day Irish. And there was there was a statement made by the Grand Master at the time, partition man called Strong, who writing to his friend Lord Dungannon, I think it was, basically pointed out that we have thrown our people in the, in the Irish Free State, we have thrown them to the wolves. And the 1920s and 1930s was a very difficult time for the Orange family in the Irish Free State and the Irish Republic because they became targets of intimidation and violence. It is quite well documented the community problems that existed within the early years of Northern Ireland and the disputes between nationalists and unionists, Protestant and Roman Catholic, but rarely is the light shone on the bitter experience of the smaller minority Protestant community in the Irish what would become the Irish Republic. You know, between 1911 and 1926, in the area that would be the Irish Free State, the Protestant population dropped by 35%. It was a massive and dramatic decline. And there were reports of intimidation, murder, massacre, and Republicans opposed Orange celebrations. The last, I think, big 12th of July celebration in what would become the Irish Republic was in 1931 as a consequence. And only towards the end of the 20th century, did you see the development of 12 celebrations at Ross Nowla in County Donegal, which remain today the only real large 12th of July celebrations in the Irish Republic. So there was a huge feeling of being wrenched from the Union by the Orange and Unionist family and what became the Irish Free State because of the steady decline of the Protestant population in the South. And indeed, the Protestant population in the South didn't start increasing until the mid-1990s. You saw a decline in the orange infrastructure in the orange family, the closure of halls. Some halls were attacked on a frequent basis, and so they just closed. At one stage, for example, in the late 1920s, County Cavan still had 
78 active orange lodges today, right across the whole of the Irish Republic, there would only be about 55 working orange lodges. One of the things that's obviously associated with the Orange Order is the marches, and that seems to attract a lot of controversy here and there. Am I accurate in saying that that's something that predated the Orange Order? It wasn't just a creation of the Orange Order to have these kind of marches? No, there were, but it became a very, very much modus operandi of how Orangism celebrated who they were. You're demonstrating their faith in public, advocating that faith is, if you like, stock and trade of the Reformed faith, of the Protestant faith, and the institution is a Protestant organisation. And they celebrated who they were through processions and celebrations. But the issue of this over disputes uh, in relation to what has been described as shared space is not something that was a 20th century invention. It was something that was within Irish society for some for some time. And it continued, you know, if you, if you like that, the faction fighting between secret agrarian societies was uh, evidence of that in the 1780s and into the 1790s. And that would continue in different forms. And you saw clashes continuing between members of the Orange community and or, at Orange celebrations and def- defenders and the, the later incarnation of those groups, like the Ribbon Men, the Threshers, uh, right through to modern day um, Republicans. So there has always been this atmosphere of, of a contested approach to shared space and public celebrations. I suppose it feeds into the politics of of a divided society that everything then becomes a zero-sum game. There's nothing, everything, if one side gets a particular issue that's seen as a victory, the other side see it as a loss, whether or not it is, and that has fed in in a very unfortunate fashion into celebrations now. It has to be said in recent years, the number of, if you like, disputed processions and parades and public celebrations has declined dramatically, and there has been I think greater understanding, greater education has led to local communities sorting out issues without them having to appear as confrontational. The Orange Order has been criticised by some as a triumphalist and supremacist organisation. But from my perspective, as a Catholic of Irish descent, in talking to Jonathan, what I see is a group of people who had a legitimate fear of an existential threat. Atrocities were committed by both sides in 1798 and in the two centuries since. But fundamentally, the Orange Order were and are earnest Protestants trying to protect their communities and their fundamental beliefs. And like anyone, we all have our history and we can try and whitewash it or we can accept it for what it is and accept that it made us the people we are today. Thankfully, since the 1990s, the sectarian tensions in Northern Ireland have abated, and the once controversial Orange marches now generally pass without incident. As Jonathan said, it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game with winners and losers. We can respect one another's beliefs and traditions, and come to realise that it's the diversity of belief and experience that has helped us to forge the rich history of both the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom of Britain and Northern Ireland. Well, stone the flaming crows. It's time for Dan to do the Harry. Watch out for the next podcast and follow all Dan's activities at www.danielmainwaring.com.